Hello everyone, it's 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 10 p.m., 10 a.m. Pacific, and it means it's start another of our Kokoros Weather Talk webinars. Today's is a special edition. We'll tell you more about that shortly. We want to thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Henry Regis. Behind the scenes today, running our technical side of our program, is Kokoros Help Desk Guru, Zach Schwalbe. And uh, hopefully joining us here shortly is Kokoros founder, Nolan Duskin. We're coming to you live from the Colorado Climate Center here in Fort Collins, Colorado at Colorado State University. It's a beautiful day out there today. Uh, for those of you who are unable to join us for our live broadcast, we'll be recording this for future viewing on our website. And all of our Weather Talk webinars are sponsored by grants from NOAA's Office of Education and the National Science Foundation. Well, we're excited to have back with us again today Greg Carbon. Greg gave a great uh, webinar on tornadoes back in April. Uh, Greg is a warning coordination meteorologist for the National Weather Service's Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma. And uh, each year, Greg puts together a presentation on the top 10 weather events in the United States during the past 12 months. Uh, Greg has given this talk to PAC rooms at various weather meetings around the country. I've seen them in the past, and, and let me tell you, they're terrific. So I've asked Greg if he would share this presentation with our audience. And he said it would his, be his pleasure to do so. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Greg Carbon for this very special Weather Talk webinar. Greg, welcome. It's great to have you with us today. Thank you very much, Henry. And uh, thanks to, uh, to Coco Ross. Let me uh, put my screen on here. Hopefully, you'll be able to see that. We're on the air. And I'll move the tab out of the way here. We can get underway. As Henry said, I'm Greg Carbon. I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist at the Storm Prediction Center. And while it's been kind of a quiet couple of weeks here, we had a busy morning today uh, with the potential for, uh, for severe weather coming up perhaps uh, late in the weekend, maybe Sunday, and uh, taking a close look at that uh, system and some of the forecasts coming up. Still not quite clear how things will evolve, but November can be, uh, can be a dangerous month for severe weather, and it can come on fast and furious, so we're getting a little concerned about this weekend kind of consumed my morning. But let's uh, talk about the past events here for the 2013 year. Um, this is my annual review, uh, the 10th anniversary of the annual review here. And we're going to go in quasi-chronological order here, talking about some of the interesting events of the year. And I don't rank the events. I'm not, calling, I'm not officially ranking these events by any means. But uh, they were all interesting in one way or another, some of them quite significant. So let's get underway. Number one, uh, January 28th, 30th, uh, beginning of the year, an early severe weather outbreak uh, during the winter season. And uh, shortly thereafter, the end of January, a significant tornado event occurring in uh, southern Mississippi. And the visible satellite imagery there in the upper right showing the day three of a three-day severe weather outbreak across the southeast United States. And then the infrared satellite in the lower left indicating a large cyclone on February 10th with the red oval uh, showing you the location where a significant EF4 tornado occurred in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. So let's review these, uh, these events uh, at the early uh, part of the year. This is a, oops, let me go back here. This is a three-day uh, infrared satellite loop and surface pressure analysis from the Weather Prediction Center in, uh, in Maryland showing the evolution of the storm system across the middle of the country. Uh, and then spreading eastward. It was strong dynamics associated with this system, as well as above normal precipitable water and moisture being brought northward from the Gulf of Mexico all the way north the Ohio Valley that led to three days of uh, severe weather activity, first beginning in the Mississippi Valley and then spreading across the Ohio Valley and southeast. Let's take a look at those three days. Uh, these are all the reports over the three-day period. Severe wind reports in blue. Severe hail reports are in the, uh, uh, the dots here, the small dots. And then the tornado reports are the small triangles and colored by F scale. On January 28th, the event got going here in the plains of Mississippi Valley. By the 29th, uh, activity picked up, moved across the Ohio Valley, middle Mississippi Valley, with quite a few tornadoes. Uh, relatively weak, but a, a cluster of uh, tornadoes across uh, the Nashville area of Tennessee. And then the third day, uh, January 30th, across the southeast United States. And you want to note the, the EF3 tornado here in northwest Georgia that occurred on the third day of this event. 
and this was uh, at Ayersville, Georgia. It was a uh, supercell storm with a tornado ahead of the squall line, and it moved into Adairsville just before noon, and I've got a video of that event here. And hopefully this will I'll run here. Well, maybe not. Huh, I'm not getting it to run here. Well, let me move on. If I, if I run into that problem again, I'm going to have to take a pause and, and correct it. So um, we'll go into the 10 days later on February 10th. Uh, this is another large cyclone centered over Iowa at this time, but very strong wind fields associated with it. The surface low pressure was in Iowa, and you had uh, low-level winds of 40 to 50 knots across the warm sector uh, from the Delta, Mississippi Delta across the Florida Panhandle, and then strong, very strong mid-level winds, 100 knots across the middle of the country coming out of the Plain States. And this sets up an environment where uh, rotating thunderstorms are quite likely, especially if they can interact with the warm front here. And that's exactly what happened across this area of southern Mississippi, where you had very, very strong low-level shear in place. Not a lot of instability, but strong shear, and any thunderstorm in that environment was going to rotate. And indeed, that's what we saw occur here. This is the picture of the tornado moving into Hattiesburg, Mississippi, uh, during the late evening or late afternoon, early evening uh, on February 10th, a Sunday evening. And there's the radar image showing the strong circulation associated with that and the hook echo uh, across this area of Mississippi. The damage was extensive. These first two pictures at the top are the Adairsville tornado. Uh, with a fatality occurring in, in Georgia on January 30th. And then the two bottom pictures here, Hattiesburg, Mississippi on February 10th, and some of the damage uh, to the University of Southern Mississippi dorm here. Uh, thank goodness no one was uh, killed in this particular event, despite significant damage in the area. So for memory number one, an early year multi-day outbreak with the greatest number of January reports on record in 2013, we did have a killer EF3 that ended a 219-day fatality-free stretch. That was a killer tornado in Georgia. And then just a few days later, the EF4 tornado uh, with damages topping $95 million in Mississippi. On to number two, the February 7th through 10th nor'easter. Uh, named Nemo by the Weather Channel and uh, Hashtag Nemo became quite popular in the Twitter sphere and uh, even garnered a Time Magazine article about the amount of attention uh, that this storm got in the metropolitan areas of the Northeast. I grew up in Vermont, and these are the storms that got me interested in meteorology. And We didn't have Twitter back then. We found out that uh, school was canceled after a big storm when the bus didn't show up. Uh, but this was indeed an amazing storm to watch, uh, coming 35 years to the day after the Great Nor'easter of 1978. February 78 nor'easter uh, that plastered parts of southern New England as well as uh, interior parts of New England. And here this loop shows the evolution of the cyclone off the coast, uh, off the east coast, the water vapor image on the left, and the color-filled uh, surface pressure on the right. And this met all the criteria for what we call classic bombogenesis with an incredibly rapidly deepening surface low pressure system. Uh, taking that classic track from east of Block Island to Nantucket and uh, dropping from 992 millibars to 970 millibars in 24 hours. And of course, the snowfall associated with this was epic. And you can see this 24-hour loop of the radar imagery here and how the snow bands set up across Long Island. Incredibly intense snowfall across parts of Connecticut. And then the system basically uh, moving away from, from, the, uh, from New England and off into the Gulf of Maine and the Canadian Maritimes. Very, very intense uh, convection here and some snowfall rates upwards six to eight inches in one hour as this band of in intense uh, snowfall came across Long Island and uh, southern Connecticut. And that was coincident with the rapid deepening of the offshore surface low. Here are some of the snowfall amounts. Uh, basically, the uh, incredible amounts of 40 inches of snow in Hampton, Connecticut, and an axis of uh, in incredible snowfall reaching almost three feet or more in places uh, across Massachusetts. Uh, record snowfall for Portland, Maine, their greatest snowfall on record with almost 32 inches in Portland, and it was the uh, second greatest snowfall on record for Concord, New Hampshire, as well as Hartford, Connecticut. An interesting image here in the days after the heavy snow fell, you could actually see the damage path that was left in the wake of the Springfield, Massachusetts tornado of June 1st, 2011. This 
path here indicating where the snow fell, but the tree damage is still in a you know still impact here, and the snowfall uh, showing where the fewer trees existed in that path long track tornado about 40 miles in length. On to number three. March and April of 2013 were dramatically different from March and April of 2012, and so this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, memorable event uh, during the year, and I wanted to take a look and do a comparison between the two years. Um, 2013, much colder, and this upper picture here we see, we'll zoom into that and see the difference between the March-April mean temperatures at the surface uh, for this year versus those that occurred during March and April of 2012. And the core of the coldest air was located across the, uh, the northern plains here, but really the entire country, especially uh, east of the Rockies, the entire nation, lower 48 states, well below normal temperatures, and that contrasted with the 2012 in which we had well above normal temperatures in this area. Also with respect to tornado activity, we had an outbreak in early March of 2012, and then it was followed by a heat wave, essentially, for the rest of the month. Uh, very little in the way of tornado activity in March of 2013, and I'll take a quick look at that as well. What a difference a year makes. These are the daily maximum temperature records comparing uh, the 2012 March and April on the left here. The max records were prolific during March and April of 2012. Very few max temperatures set this year. And then the minimum temperature records in 2012 versus the minimum temperature records that were set this year. And what I plotted here were the daily records, but only for those stations with a long-term record of 75 years or better, and only where records were broken by plus or minus one degree Fahrenheit, uh, greater than one degree Fahrenheit. And so really not much compares to the record high temperatures we saw in 2012. Uh, but you can see, I mean, a very dramatic contrast between the two years. And then as far as tornado activity goes, we saw only 14 tornadoes reported in the U.S. during March of 2013. That was the fewest tornadoes on record since March of 1969. So I went back to March of 1969 when eight tornadoes were reported. And here's the 500 millibar, the mid-level pattern uh, and anomaly for that mar month of March of 1969 compared to the anomaly pattern for this year. And you can see very similar patterns with below normal temperature or below normal heights uh, across the eastern half of the country. And this usually correspond, corresponds with cooler than normal temperatures and a very similar pattern that we saw in 2013. And so this gives us some interesting prospects for the possibility of maybe longer range or seasonal prediction in terms of tornadoes. And I'll show you why. Here's the forecast that was issued in late February for the 500 millibar pattern that was to occur in the upcoming subsequent month of March. And so this was a reasonably good forecast showing this anomalously low uh, height values in the mid-levels of the atmosphere, very similar to what we saw observed. And this gives us maybe some hope that we can maybe get into forecasting uh, seasonal activity, at least the lack of tornado activity, if we know a pattern like this is beginning to evolve. Um, so we're going to take a closer look at the potential for the climate forecast system model to perhaps uh, give us some lead time when it comes to uh, severe weather activity in the ensuing month, especially in the cool season. And the snowfall was a record, too. It continued into the month of May with record snows across the, uh, especially across the northern United States, Minnesota, a number of significant snowstorms there. The snow depth for the month of March uh, was, was the greatest uh, snow depth, the uh, 10th grade this in 50 years of records there as far as the aerial coverage of snow uh, during the month of March over the continental United States. And then this graphic just shows you the split personality between what we saw in 2012 and what we saw this year in 2013. And again, those records continuing. Minnesota setting one, two, and three-day snowstorm records in the month of May, in early May and a near record low number of tornadoes for this period of time. Well, the tornado lull did not last, especially for parts of the central and southern plains. There was a bit of a lull during the beginning of the month of May, but then by the time we reached uh, the middle uh, end of the month, uh, things had turned dramatically, and the atmosphere is almost like a switch went off, and the people, unfortunately, in parts of Oklahoma suffered greatly uh, during this three-day tornado outbreak. 
uh, May 18th through 20th, and then the subsequent tornado events occurring at the very end of the month. Let's look at the three-day event here from the 18th through the 20th first. And you can see here that this is the first day of the event, the upper right infrared satellite imagery showing the watches in effect and the widespread thunderstorm activity and storm reports there, the little uh, dots, A, green for hail, uh, the cyan blue colored wind reports, and then a couple of tornadoes here too. And then some of the damage that occurred with these tornadoes. This is Saturday, May 18th, the storm reports associated with the first day of the event. And conditions were very favorable for supercell thunderstorms and tornadoes basically for northwest Texas up across western Kansas. On this particular day, one of the more significant tornadoes occurred near Roselle, Kansas with a population of 157. This was an EF4 tornado that occurred during the early evening hours and just missed the uh, small town of Roselle, Kansas. The following day, Sunday, May 19th, activity shifted just a bit east and south. And while this day featured one particular storm that looked like it had a beeline on on Wichita, Kansas with a significant tornado. Wichita just missed the bullet with that one and then it was a few hours later that significant tornadoes formed to the south of that on I-35 just north of Oklahoma City and another significant tornado just east and over from my location where I live in Norman and on east over to Shawnee. I'm going to take a look at that particular event uh, from the perspective that I had here in Norman, Oklahoma. Here's a series of images associated with the Shawnee supercell and tornado. This first image in the upper left I took from my backyard. And at this time, I was not all that concerned about the prospect for a tornadic storm. I could see that this was a wall cloud, but I did not observe very rapid rotation with it. This is the very formative stages of the supercell storm. And just south of my location, at exactly the same time, an SPC forecaster located at the Storm Prediction Center was taking this picture. And here's where I was looking at the storm. There's, I'm looking into, toward the west, and he's looking toward the north. And much more threatening look to the storm from his perspective than from mine. It was only a short while later, uh, about a half hour later, that the tornado touched down uh, just east of my location, about seven miles east at Lake Thunderbird. And then a half hour after that, with a violent tornado, moving into Shawnee, Oklahoma. And then Monday, May 20th dawns, and the, the system uh, not moving very much at all. We knew that this was a potentially volatile day, and that thunderstorms uh, would probably form a little earlier, but would affect very much the same areas that they had affected the day before, and the potential for significant tornadoes existed, especially across southern central Oklahoma and on up into Missouri. Again, these are the, the summary of the reports during that period, and unfortunately the most significant tornado on this day was the Moore Oklahoma tornado, later rated EF5. This tornado formed a little earlier than usual for central Oklahoma, uh, taking shape a little after between 2 and 3 in the afternoon. Uh, rapidly intensified to violent tornado phase and unfortunately moved right across more Oklahoma uh, during the mid to late afternoon hours. Here's the radar loop showing the evolution of the supercell thunderstorm and the hook echo moving across uh, Interstate 44 and then more to the east. This is the densely populated area of more Oklahoma. Norman is here. Oklahoma City is to the north. And it crossed, crossed I-35 at about 3.30 in the afternoon and then rapidly dissipated just to the east of Moore. So this tornado was at its most intense, unfortunately, where the population density was, uh, was the highest. And this is uh, another video here, and I don't know if I'm going to have a problem showing these videos. For some reason, they do not like to show here. Um, and I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll move on, and we'll go back and try to reset some of these videos at the end of the talk. This is a video taken by Chris Broyles, an SPC forecaster, who was just south of Moore, Oklahoma as the tornado formed. So we'll go back and look at some of these uh, at the end of the talk. Just devastating uh, damage in the city of Moore. Uh, this brought out the President of the United States uh, who came to thank forecasters and also tour the damage areas in Moore, Oklahoma in the wake of the event. Um, I took the picture in the bottom here, this panorama scene, a few days later while trying to help pick up the pieces. Uh, very, very dramatic event. Uh, when you look at the degree of damage that occurred with this tornado, it's, it's remarkable that the death toll wasn't higher than it was. It was unfortunate uh, with the fatalities we had at the school there and more. Um, but many people did get the message and did get to safety, and, uh, and the damage 
oxygen death toll could have been much higher than it was. This was also a very rare event for May. Uh, you would think that we'd see more of these days, but it's very unusual to see three consecutive days with F4 or 5 tornadoes rated. It's usually one or two days uh, with significant uh, violent tornadoes. This was three days in a row with a violent tornado being rated, one in Roselle, Kansas, the other one in Shawnee, and the other one in Moore. And it didn't end there. Uh, just a little over a week later, on May 31st, uh, we had this significant event occur just west of the Oklahoma City area, the El Reno tornado. Uh, I labeled this one, what the EF uh, was that? And uh, there was a considerable amount of emotion and controversy associated with this storm. Uh, the rating was uh, a bit controversial at first. It's been rated EF3 now by the National Weather Service. It was initially rated EF5 based on radar information. This is a picture in the upper right here of the storm spotters and chasers that were in place, and very many of them at risk here uh, in this intense vortex associated with, with the El Reno tornado. And of course, the Weather Channel was also caught off guard here and uh, tossed, uh, their vehicle tossed off I-40, uh, and remarkable that the injuries were not uh, significant with that, uh, given the, the damage that occurred with that. But we did lose uh, some respected uh, storm researchers and chasers in this tornado, and in the days that followed, there was a lot of introspective, introspective uh, uh, discussion about uh, chasing and, uh, and the dangers of it. Here at the Storm Prediction Center, what I was doing on that Friday evening was looking at the um, high-resolution model guidance as part of the hazardous weather test bed that's located here in Norman. We're running a number of high-resolution models to better anticipate the potential for severe storms. Um, and this is just some examples of the, the data that we were looking at. This event uh, was characterized by extreme instability across uh, central and western Oklahoma that was coincident with incredibly strong wind shear in the atmosphere. Not the strongest low-level helicity that we would, we would expect to see for strong tornadoes. However, this, this particular parameter most likely strengthened dramatically after the uh, thunderstorms developed and the intense changes that occurred uh, in the mass fields once you had those updrafts in place. Um, we were also dealing with an air mass, at least initially, that was strongly capped and would prevent thunderstorm development. So these thunderstorms that did eventually evolve were, were very focused over a very small area and were processing a tremendous amount of air. And that, that uh, process causes changes in the mass fields and changes in the low-level wind shear to produce violent tornadoes. Down at the bottom here, I've got a loop of some of the model guidance. These are two different models here indicating uh, thunderstorm development. And then this is the actual radar. So you can follow this loop here to see. The models actually did the storm scale guidance that we had to review here did very good, very well in depicting the evolution of the thunderstorms across central Oklahoma. When you compare that, I'm trying to, sorry, I keep switching back and forth here. Let me go back to that loop. When you compare these two on the left with the actual radar image on the right, you can get an idea of how well the models perform in terms of the thunderstorm development. And one thing the models did not get right is that there was this tendency for storms to backbuild across uh, central Oklahoma. And what we mean by backbuild is redevelop on the southwest flank. That resulted in incredible rainfall amounts across the Oklahoma City area. In fact, up to seven, eight inches of rain occurring in six hours. And this was not handled very well by the storm scale models. They did indicate the potential for severe storms and tornadoes, but perhaps not as big a signal for, flood, for the flooding rains that were experienced. We're going to look at the phased array radar, research radar here in Norman, Oklahoma, and the evolution of the thunderstorm and tornado across El Reno, which is right about in here. This is the Oklahoma City area. Here's the tornado coming out of the El Reno storm right there. And it becomes absorbed back into the larger mass of, of convection and thunderstorms uh, after, after moving across you know, near the El Reno area. I'll play this one more time. It's over a four-hour period here. And uh, the scans that you're seeing are one-minute scans from the phased array radar, which is a research radar located at the National Severe Storms Laboratory in Norman. There's the circulation once again becoming wrapped up into the larger thunderstorm complex. And throughout the evening, you continue to see these circulations on the southern and southwestern flank of this thunderstorm complex. We'll zoom in a little more, 60 miles across here. Take another look at this zoomed in. An un unbelievable and fascinating view 
uh, in terms of the evolution of the, the circulation associated with the updraft of this thunderstorm. Let's go in a little bit further here, about 30 miles across, and it gets a little, a little coarse resolution here. This is still the hook echo, but we can go in even further, perhaps four miles across, and take a look at the Raxpole research radar and the picture that it had of this tornado. Um, this is research radar run by the University of Oklahoma, and here you're looking at the actual tornado circulation and a satellite tornado uh, within, the, within the larger hook echo. It was this radar that was used to determine the wind speeds in excess of 200 miles an hour and then initially resulted in an EF5 rating. But damage at the surface uh, was not evident uh, with those wind speeds. We did not find damage the EF5 rate to, to support that EF5 rating. So the tornado was later uh, rated back to an EF3, although all indications were this was an incredibly violent and complex tornado event. So in summary, another memorable uh, and scary tornado event for the Oklahoma City area on Friday evening, May 31st here. The widest damage path on record of any tornado at 2.6 miles wide. Not a very long track tornado, uh, but an incredibly complicated and violent and, and unpredictable in terms of its short-term motion because some people really got caught off guard uh, by the movement of this and, and, the, and the size of this tornado. Perhaps one of the greater threats that was maybe a little underestimated was the rainfall that occurred uh, during and in the wake of the actual tornado event. Seven to eight inches of rain on this evening, and that boosted the uh, rainfall uh, for the month of May in Oklahoma City to a new record. I did bring up some questions about the volatile environment perhaps causing some erratic behavior with this tornado. There's a lot of research that needs to be done in this area. Uh, this is definitely a, an unusual and unique event. On to number six, we've got the June 12th and 13th derechos here. Um, after the June 29th, 2012 derecho event that occurred from the Ohio Valley to the mid-Atlantic coast, uh, the public was really tuned into the potential for derechos, and this potential generated an awful lot of interest uh, in the media and in the public. Uh, when we started talking about the potential for widespread damaging winds for June 12th, and that continued on into the 13th. So let's take a look at these two days, and I'll give a little quiz here uh, to those of you watching. I ask here to match the upper level wind pattern with the resulting reports uh, for that day. So we have three different wind patterns here on three different days, and then one report, one day of reports, wind reports here in the lower right. And so these are upper level winds, about the 300 millibar level, what we call near the jet stream. And you're dealing with uh, wind speeds here in excess of 100 miles an hour at the jet stream level in all of these, where you start to see the blue is around 100 miles an hour. Uh, and there are different patterns resulting. Which one of these three resulted in these reports? And I'll ask another one. How about we'll leave the wind report, the wind maps the same, but change the storm report map here and ask you to match the uh, uh, the wind report, the wind upper wind obs with the reports A, B, or C, resulting in this day, and then finally a third chance here A, B, or C. Well, let's take a look. Number A was June twelfth, and this was the upper level wind pattern that supported uh, fairly widespread and significant wind from uh, in Indiana across Ohio. A few tornadoes back in Iowa at the beginning of the event, and then the second day of the event, the event June thirteenth. The jet had moved up across New England. Still some relatively stronger upper-level winds here across the mid-Atlantic and widespread, even more widespread wind damage with this event. And then the third event that I showed you was the event from last year. I'll go back to that in just a minute. But here's the summary of the two days, June 12th and 13th, 2013, showing the initial uh, evolution here of the storms across the upper Midwest and then evolution during the late evening and overnight hours into a bow echo that moved off the Jersey Shore. Uh, early on the 13th, and then not long after, some new storms developing in the Ohio Valley and causing another widespread wind event across the mid-Atlantic into the Carolinas and even northern Georgia on the 13th. This was the event from last year. And what's interesting is the wind fields are not as strong in this particular event from last year, June 29th. That should be 2012, not 2013. Um, 
but we had uh, many more significant wind reports with this. And the big difference between these two years was the uh, degree of instability in the low levels of the atmosphere. On the left here is the morning of June 12th of this year, showing that the uh, lapse rates, just a measure of instability in the atmosphere, really confined to west of the Mississippi River and not so much over the Ohio Valley. And contrast that with what we had in place on the morning of June 29th, 2012, where we had incredible instability situated across the Ohio, Tennessee Valleys, and even the East Coast. It was this instability that led to the more widespread and significant damaging winds that we, we saw with the deratio in 2012. But nonetheless, we had a two-day deratio, uh, two-day event occur here in 2013. There's a picture of Chicago with the storms moving into the area on June 12th, the squall line in the Appalachian Mountains on the 13th, and even an EF3 tornado in Iowa on the 12th, and still a considerable amount of wind damage with this event in 2013. Well, on to num number seven, and this is a very, uh, very uh, uh, fateful day uh, for the wildland firefighter community here in Yarnell, uh, Arizona, and I want to review this event. Uh, there was an investigative report recently released, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, but just for reference, uh, this is the deadliest wildland fire in over 80 years, um, with 19 firefighters losing their lives on this day uh, near Yarnell, Arizona, which is where the star is here. And let's zoom in on this area and look a little more at the uh, terrain and where this, uh, where this fire occurred. So again, Yarnell is located uh, northwest of the Phoenix area here. It's about 700 people in that community, about 90 miles uh, northwest of Phoenix. And let's zoom in a little closer here to this. This box is now zoomed in, and we've got the terrain up here. And we've got an interesting uh, topography. It's, you know, it's, it's north of the, the lower deserts, and you're starting to get up into the mountainous terrain of central Arizona here. An interesting uh, northwest to southeast ridge line and then a high valley to the north of that ridge line. And so the city of Yarnell is located uh, in that, above that, uh, the lower deserts and the higher terrain. And then this is the area in which the fire occurred. The fire started on the ridge line just to the west of Yarnell, Arizona, on the evening of Friday, June 28th. It was, by, it was ignited by lightning in the low chaparral and brush near the ridge line. And it grew in size over the next 24 hours to about uh, 300 acres and uh, began to show the potential for spreading. This area had not seen wildfire activity in nearly 50 years, and so there was a lot of brush, and they were in long-term drought, so conditions were very favorable for fire spread as we went into the weekend. Uh, by Sunday, June 30th, perhaps uh, about, three, about 1,000 acres in size are growing to at least uh, that size by the end of the day, certainly. The hotshot crew... Uh, called the Granite Mountain Hotshots, uh, was deployed on the fire during the morning of Sunday, June 30th. Extreme fire behavior was observed throughout the day as thunderstorms erupted to the north of the fire and then sent winds of shifting and erratic winds into the area through the late afternoon, and the fire grew to 8,000 acres in a very short period of time. Unfortunately, the firefighters captured um, by this extensive and, and extreme fire behavior. And this uh, is a visible satellite image taken a few days later, and you can see that just the burned area uh, associated with the fire, uh, structures lost in the Yarnell area, and unfortunately the firefighters' lives lost as well. There was a video, and it was taken from this perspective uh, from Congress, Arizona, uh, around the time that the fire reached its uh, extreme behavior, and we'll take a look at that video too. I'm going to go back and we'll find those, all of these videos in just a moment. This is a satellite uh, loop showing the evolution and the visible satellite imagery of the fire. You see the smoke there by the red circle. The uh, thunderstorms erupting north of the fire, and then even a thunderstorm right over the fire at the later part of this loop. And it really was this storm that formed over the, the fire that probably caused the incredible behavior and the uh, shifting and erratic high winds that caused the firefighters to get trapped and uh, unfortunately uh, caught by surprise by this dramatic fire. So there was uh, a sad day at Yarnell. Uh, these uh, 
extremely uh, dedicated firefighters uh, caught uh, unaware of the potential for the fire to grow out of control on this day. Uh, the report that was done did indicate that uh, information had been passed to the firefighting community in this area, but uh, perhaps not recognized as much as, uh, as what had occurred. They did not recognize the threat uh, that, that developed in that area. Overall, for 2013, uh, the wildland fire acreage burned is about 50% of normal over the last decade. So even though we had this incredibly devastating fire in Arizona, uh, much of the country experienced below normal fire activity in 2013. On to number eight, a weird and wet kind of summer. And uh, well, I'll show you the weird part first, and then we'll talk a little more about the records and even talk a little bit about cocoa rust observations in, in this memory. So first, the weird part here. This is something unusual. When you see an upper level low pressure system moving to the west, uh, especially in the summertime, uh, we saw low pressure develop out of the uh, uh, central part of Canada here with this upper level trough at 500 millibars becoming cut off from the westerlies and then absorbed by the deep easterly flow across the central and southern United States. And you can see this low pressure system as it evolves across the Great Lakes and drops south and then drifts due westward rather quickly across the central part of the country. And this is the 24 hour rainfall accumulating associated with that system and other thunderstorms on these days from uh, early on the 17th. This is a seven-day loop from the 10th of July to the 17th of July. Parts of Oklahoma and Texas got uh, much needed rainfall from this system. In fact, some parts of Texas saw well, uh, maybe a little more than what they needed with uh, upwards of 10 inches of rain in some isolated parts of uh, Texas around mineral wells uh, as this upper level low went across that area. So the next one we're going to look at here is basically the month that follows. This is the uh, period from July 18th through August 17th. And it's just the 24-hour accumulating precipitation during this period of about a month. And what you see here begin to evolve, especially across Kansas, is an incredibly wet pattern developing with repeat thunderstorm activity for many days during this one-month period. And in the end, some locations seeing upwards of 12 to 14, even 16 inches of rainfall um, in fact, I think there might even be close to two feet of rain, 24 inches of rain across parts of Kansas uh, during this one month period. There are many other records set as well. We'll talk about those in just a minute. But really, it was this corridor from Kansas across southwest Missouri and even into parts of Oklahoma that experienced incredible rainfall during the middle of the summer. Here are some of the daily rainfall records from the 18th, through the 7th, 18th of July through the 17th of August. Over 100 daily records broken with more than 2 inches in 24 hours. The more than 2 inch in 24 hours are the dark black circles here. And I use the same criteria as I used with the temperature record maps I showed earlier. These are only stations with a 75 year or better record and only records that were broken uh, by a tenth of an inch or greater. And uh, so again, you see where that heavy rainfall occurred across Kansas, parts of Oklahoma. But there are other places as well. And in fact, when I looked at the Coca Ross database, I found that there were 10 states that during this period of time that recorded six or more inches of rain in a 24-hour period. And those are the states that I put the red stars on there. So this was a really active, very wet pattern uh, that was set up across a large part of the country uh, right smack in the middle of summer. And some of the incredible uh, records that were set here include those Gainesville, Florida had their wettest ju July on record, and very little of that coming from tropical cyclone activity, just general thunderstorms. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on July 28th had over seven inches of rain in 24 hours, which is the greatest daily rainfall record in 141 years of record. And during that rainfall event, they had over an inch, almost an inch and a half of rainfall in 13 minutes in Philadelphia. In Missouri, record flooding on the Gasconade River in central uh, Missouri, and parts of Kansas also seeing incredible rainfall, up to two feet of rain uh, during the month uh, between the middle, of, middle end of July and the middle of August. I wish we had more time because you could just go through the list of records and it's just mind-boggling to see the rainfall records that fell during this past summer. Well, speaking of rainfall, we'll stick to this theme of, uh, of incredibly wet and, uh, and dangerous weather here. 
And number nine uh, has to be the September 12th through 14th record Colorado floods, in which some of you who are listening today, especially the folks there at the Coco Ross headquarters, know uh, very much about um, and the devastation that occurred, especially in the canyons and uh, in those areas that saw just extreme rainfall over a very short period of time. So let's review this event. The upper level system uh, in the atmosphere here shown in the infrared imagery centered over the Great Basin. And this is a very slow moving large cyclone and bringing moisture north with it. Uh, the inset graphic here showing the high levels of moisture coming in at different layers of the atmosphere. So you had this extensive conveyor belt transporting moisture from the tropics, subtropics, uh, into the Intermountain Western region. And then you had the lift provided by this upper level cyclone in the Great Basin. The precipitable water values in their percent of normal uh, for September 13th here, we're looking at a map that just shows the high moisture content air of the plains and, and stall along this front. This frontal boundary played a crucial role as well, uh, backed up into the higher terrain of northeast Colorado. And precipitable water is the amount of water in the atmosphere. If you wrung out the column above your head, this is what you would get, about an inch or inch and a half, inch and a quarter. And for this time of year, on this date, these values are double what they normally would be when you look at the long-term average. Again, the upper level system to the west of Colorado uh, aided in providing large-scale lift and ascent across the Rockies. The purple here showing the, the wind, the stronger wind speeds, the jet stream level, and they have this divergent or difluent pattern over the mountains indicating the potential for ascent and lift in the atmosphere. And that was occurring coincident with this stalled frontal zone that had backed up into the higher terrain where the moisture content of the air was very, very high. And then on the uh, northern and eastern sides of this front, the low-level winds at about the, uh, the, the area of the terrain were upslope winds, so you were bringing that moist air into the terrain and causing orographic ascent. So you had all the ingredients coming together here in northeast Colorado for an incredibly severe uh, uh, rainfall event, and that's indeed what we saw occur. So you go from one of your drier years on record in Boulder, Colorado, to a new record wet year. Uh, before the year is out, uh, pretty remarkable to see the wettest year on record uh, occur in September and uh, all over a period of just a couple of days. Some of the damage on the canyon roads there before and after picture. And uh, the bottom left there is the wagon wheel bunkhouse at the mouth of the uh, uh, Big Thompson Canyon. Um, I stayed at this ranch a few years ago. Uh, I had a colleague who was married out there, and the damage is just phenomenal here, showing, showing the, the mud and debris uh, flooding the uh, first floor of the wagon wheel bunkhouse. And then this picture taken in Boulder of the water streaming off the higher terrain. So certainly a memorable event when you get a year's worth of rainfall in about two to three days. Uh, some claim that the Big Thompson flooding was worse than that which occurred in 1976, which was on a much smaller scale, much more localized thunderstorm scale. Uh, this event this year, a much larger area affected. Uh, the last count I had was eight fatalities, and they're still counting the amount of damage and still working on repairing the roads and, and getting back up uh, before winter sets in. So as we usually do, and uh, I'm not sure if we've done this before with Coco Ross, but we're still in the current year. So event number 10 will remain a question mark until I... Uh, finish out the year and pick something that uh, perhaps uh, meets the interesting criteria and I can put a few slides together on that event. Uh, but until then, we'll, we'll hold it at nine and we'll add a tenth event uh, either toward the end of the year or perhaps early in 2014. So here's the summary of, uh, of my nine memorable events for 2013 and I appreciate you listening today. And let me see if I can set up the, uh, if you want to give me just a second there, guys, um, and uh, perhaps go back to a title screen, I'm going to see if I can call up some of those short videos that we missed uh, during the main presentation. Would that be okay? That would be great, Greg. We really appreciate that. that. That It would be neat to see. I've got a quick question for you while we're waiting for those to, to pull up. The, the derechos that happened, uh, is June a typical month for those? I notice uh, both occur in June, um, uh, Ohio Valley uh, through parts of the uh, uh, the east, is, is that a typical time to see those? That's certainly not uncommon. Uh, we kind of transition from, uh, uh, from the tornado threat 
to more of a, a wind threat as we go into the summer months. Primarily, you lose some of the, the more cyclonic activity that you see during the uh, late spring and early summer. And you transition more into an upper ridge across the middle of the country that provides the instability but also caps the air mass in the plains. And it's the edge of that ridge where you intersect the stronger residual flow from the, from the cool season. Uh, you get the pattern to be just right and you can set up uh, the conditions needed for deratio events. And so June and July uh, are usually the common times of year for those events, but they can occur just about any time of year. Okay, thanks. Uh, you know, I'm going to take a question or two while Greg's setting up here. I, we've got a few have come in. Uh, Lloyd wants to know, what is the significance of the 500 millibar height? You mentioned that in several things. He was wondering what, what, what that's all about. Okay, uh, meteorologists have used that standard level uh, of the atmosphere uh, for many years. Uh, what it is is basically the, the steering currents for weather systems, and, and kind of the evolution of a lot of weather systems occur in the middle and upper levels of the atmosphere. They not, may not necessarily be evident right away at the surface. So we look at the mid-levels of the atmosphere uh, for steering and where the sort of where the the river of air is coming from and and the amplitude of that uh, that air is also an indication of upper level motion or downward motion and so the 500 millibar layer is kind of where meteorologists look to uh, to get a better indication of what what's going on in the larger atmosphere um, and it's also relatively close as far as balloon observations and aircraft you have sensors there. Um, where you can you can come up with a pretty good understanding of what's going on up there as opposed to higher up at the jet stream level. Um, so it's a good level for meteorologists to get a first look at, uh, at what what's going on in the atmosphere. Thanks Greg. Let us, let, us let you get your slides up. There we go. Here. Yeah. Yeah, so let me let me do this. Okay, um, we'll hold off on questions still. To... Yeah. How are you doing on time? You okay? Yeah. You get... Okay. I'm okay, yep. So okay. here's our first one. Are we showing my screen again? Yeah, Looks here's good. the Adairsville. Here we go. Okay. This is the Adairsville tornado. It's coming this way, too. Hey, that's a tornado, buddy. Some power flashes with that, and some nice local local dialect there. Uh, let's see, I had this one too. Wanted to show you. This is the uh, time lapse. This is a thunder snow uh, during the blizzard of uh, February eighth. Just wonderful to hear that, and it must have been incredible to be in that event where six inches of snow are falling in an hour. Actually, I've got one other one from that, and I think I'll show it here in the lower right. You can see the time-lapse accumulation of the snowfall associated with the blizzard in the northeast. There's some digging that's, to do there. That's a great shot. Yeah. <laughs> and we have the uh, more tornado. This is the uh, video taken by Chris Broyles. Time lapse as well. Now, did you see the more tornado when you were working that day? Was that close enough? I did to... not. Uh, no. Okay. It, it was not close enough to where the storm prediction center is to see to see it. Um, incredibly devastating event uh, for more. And let's see, did I have one another one here? I think that was, oh, the Yarnell, wanted to show you the Yarnell Hill fire. So again, this is the perspective that was taken on this fire uh, at about the time that it reached its most intense. So the, the photographer, the videographer is right about here to the southwest of the fire. And some of you may have seen this. This made the rounds uh, 
quite a bit um, on the internet. And I don't know, is it going to work? Doesn't look like it wants to work. Um, let's see. That's because it's not in that directory. Well, let me find it. So you've been putting the, this that one is you. been putting the review together for ten years now. You say? Yes. That's great. That's <laughs> great. Well, I would. I can't find it here at the moment. I, I would. Um, I'd say that you can find it though very easily on the internet if you uh, you search for uh, Yarnell Hill. Uh, that is a remarkable video taken during the peak of the, the fire's intensity. Uh, and it's it's been on the web and it's it's available through the YouTube. So if you search for it, you should be able to find the one that I was talking about there. So there you go. Um, glad to do this again, and and thanks for Coco Ross, and thanks for your attention. Oh, we really appreciate this. Again, I had seen you do the ones for 2011 and 12, and they were just as spectacular. And so uh, maybe we can uh, talk to you next year and, and have you back again uh, at the uh, in 2014 to look at those. Um, that would be great. Absolutely. Well, let, let, Glad to do it. If you have a little bit of time now, we'll take some questions and uh, we'll uh, we'll try to answer. We've got a whole bunch of them coming in, so uh, I know you you're busy with the severe weather coming up this weekend. So when you have to go, just let us know. Um, we'll try to get some in here real quickly. Um, uh, I, Diane writes, and she want to know what is the what's the definition of a derecho? So what what is a derecho? It's kind of a the one the one definition that we we uh, kind of look at for those events is the uh, linear or the, the length of the the path of of the wind damage threat. So we're looking for something that's a stretching um, over a period of hours in about 250 miles. It has to be an organized complex of storms, usually a line of storms or a bow echo, and that bow echo of storms has to be producing severe wind gusts, 50 miles an hour, 59 miles an hour, greater, and it has to extend uh, along a path of at least 250 miles. So we kind of use that 250 mile uh, measure as uh, as a, uh, a first first guess for it, does this qualify as a duration? It's a loose definition, but it definitely has to be relatively long lived in terms of its intensity. Okay, thanks. Paul in California writes, he says, how about for number 10 uh, being a none event, uh, i.e. not one hurricane to strike the mainland of the U.S. this year? How unusual is that? Well, it, it, I have talked in the past about the tropics, um, and in fact, last year's number 10 event was Sandy, and uh, so when I did this, when I put this talk together uh, during the late summer, August, and into September, of course, I left number 10 open, and I was certainly thankful that uh, I did that because Sandy turned out to be perhaps the most memorable event uh, of 2012. Um, and I have in the past, in many past talks, uh, gotten to the tropics actually even before number 10. Uh, and I, I agree, the lack of, uh, of hurricane activity in the Atlantic Basin uh, for this year could indeed take uh, position number 10. You're getting ahead of me, though. <laughs> so I'm not quite ready to commit to that yet. Okay. Uh, here's Mary. Mary wants to know that will the training to spot storms change after what we learn from the El Reno tornado? So will there be any changes taking place from these lessons learned? Well, I think the Weather Service is actually uh, involved in a review of the rating scale, for one. Uh, there are shortcomings in the way tornadoes are rated, uh, and, and this uh, particular event uh, revealed those shortcomings. Uh, in our database, we don't really have uh, the ability to include wind speeds that are estimated or measured by, by radar. And that was one of the problems that, uh, that came up with El Reno, that we had these radar observations, but there was a debate as to whether those radar observations actually convey uh, what's going on at the ground. So if that's what you mean by changes, uh, I'm involved in some of the discussions uh, with respect to uh, how we rate tornadoes and how we track uh, the historical significance of these events. Um, when it comes to the actual behaviors of people that are associated with going after these storms, um, that's kind of beyond <laughs> my capability to control. Um, I, I, you know, there, there's a lot of people out there that are trying to get close to these storms and, 
and this event really brings home the point that even if you know what you think you're doing, uh, there's an inherent danger to that activity. And uh, so people need to realize that before they just jump in their car and say, I'm going to go chase a tornado. Um, we and myself in particular have been saying for years when these events occur, get to shelter. So, um, you know, I'm going to continue to say that. And uh, I, I think that uh, some of the folks that are out there trying to get closer uh, really need to think long and hard about what they're doing. And, uh, and that, you know, I've been saying all along, don't, you don't want to mess with this. You want to get away or get to a safe place. So, it uh, seems like everyone it, now it was, it was an eye-opening event. With everyone with cell phone cameras now, everybody wants to get a picture of these things too, so you, you may not uh, right. follow right. the advice as well. Hey, here, here's one from a friend of ours, Jan, in New Mexico, and he wants to know, do you feel that the precipitation frequency intensity maps are underestimating observed intense rainfall? Well, those intensity maps are, I'm not, I mean, you mean the accumulation maps, I suppose, that I put together there. Um, the, uh, the accumulation maps, the 24-hour maps that I put together, uh, are multi-sensor. They're based uh, on observations like Coco Ross observations, but they're also uh, using radar estimated precipitation in concert with the, the observational data. Um, I think it's understood, well understood, though, that but some of the more intense precipitation is usually undermeasured because there, we don't have measuring devices that can actually capture extremely heavy rainfall. You usually have a little bit of slopping out of the rain gauge, and so the the most intense rainfall events are probably a bit underestimated. I haven't done any studies on that, but I think there have been studies done about uh, various gauges and their ability to capture extreme rainfall. So, you know, I would think that. Uh, there, there's probably a, you know a bit of an underestimate underestimation on the on the very highest side of those amounts, uh, but for the most part, when you use radar and observe data like we do, uh, I think you get pretty close to uh, a, a, um, a reasonable amount uh, of precipitation for for many of these events. Uh, but on the high end, I'd say there's probably a bit of underestimating going on. Okay. Uh, here's uh, Ruta from Maine. She's got a question, a couple quick questions here for you. Uh, so in the 10 years that you've been doing this, uh, these reviews, what is the biggest change in your work? Uh, has the technology changed much? And have you seen a trend in the changes in severe weather? So three different ones, change in your work, technology changes, and changes in severe weather trends. That's, <laughs> That's a, a lot. That's a great question. And <laughs> yeah. I think that, yeah. Um, well, certainly my, my approach hasn't changed to, to doing this, but actually I think my job in, in putting these together has gotten a little bit easier. Uh, when I first started this, um, it, it was sometimes difficult to get, get the data back that I needed for, for particular events, and it seems like that's gotten a little easier. That you know, Now with the Internet and with people posting to blogs or posting to Facebook or Twitter, you can usually get a tremendous amount of information, even about past events. So, the technology in terms of uh, the social media out there uh, when it comes to weather has changed dramatically in the 10 years. It allows perhaps the, the um, it aids in my ability to put a, a summary like this together every year. Um, Storm-wise, uh, boy, I, you know, I, I could go back uh, and look, but I, I don't get a sense that they're dramatically different. I will say that probably the most dramatic, uh, Katrina certainly comes to mind, and Sandy. Those are probably two of the more dramatic meteorological events I can think of um, in the last decade or so. Um, you know, tor there are plenty of tornado events as well, but in terms of scale and overall impact, uh, Katrina and Sandy are really the ones that stand out. And Sandy was a really remarkable storm on so many levels that uh, uh, it, I, was, I was really absorbed by, by that meteorological event for quite some time. I lost you if you're trying. I'm 
don't hear anything there. Oh, I'm sorry, I had the mic off. There we go. <laughs> I, my, my question was that for, for, you, for you personally, do you, in your, your career as a meteorologist or in your lifetime, is there one event that you put on the top of the list and say, wow, this, this really, I, I experienced this, and it, uh, it's probably one of the most significant weather events I've seen? Well, for me personally, I, I always go back to the nor'easters that I grew up with, and the one nor'easter in particular I mentioned in this talk, which was the uh, the February 1978 blizzard. The blizzard in 1978 was just a, a really incredible storm. Um, I remember going out that day, and I remember coming down into the kitchen that morning. I knew that we would see a lot of snow, and then I realized, I thought I was up too early because the, the room was dark, and then I realized that the snow was actually up over the kitchen window, and that's why it was dark. <laughs> it was light outside, but none of the light was getting in because we'd been snowed in completely. The first floor of the house basically completely covered in, in snow in just a short period of time of 12 hours overnight. So that one stands out for me. I love nor'easters, but I call myself an equal opportunity meteorologist because I love all sorts of interesting weather. And, um, and so hopefully I'll be able to continue to do the annual summaries uh, but always have an eye on the nor'easters. That's neat. Yeah, I, I, I grew up in the northeast and remember those well myself. Uh, a couple other questions here we have coming in. Uh, Pam, uh, wanted to, she's out there in Oklahoma, and she wanted to let you know that the National Weather Service warnings uh, and the professional observations and stuff coming from the TV stations did save many lives during those Oklahoma tornadoes, and she was very appreciative uh, about those. Um, Okay, let's see. We've got another one here. Uh, roll clouds. So Terry is in Texas, or Terry's, and he wanted to know. Yesterday there were roll clouds seen. Uh, what are they? Could you comment on those? With the, more about roll clouds. Well, possibly yeah, saw some. Too. Possible he saw some of the same clouds I saw yesterday morning. Um, I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before, where we saw uh, a number of. Uh, banded cloud patterns in the atmosphere, and it depends. Sometimes they're caused by uh, waves in the atmosphere. Most of the time they're going to be waves in the atmosphere, but the origin of those waves can be different things. And you often see uh, roll or wave clouds over the Rocky Mountains, but you can also see them away from the mountains associated with uh, cold fronts. Um, you can see them associated with thunderstorms and thunderstorm outflow. Um, there's just a variety of ways in which you can get them, and a lot. I, I really can't speak to what you saw because I'm not quite sure at what level those clouds formed um, and, and where they were, what time of day, and the orientation. Um, but the cl clouds, especially in that form, are fascinating to watch. And sometimes they can be quite persistent and really stable, sort of in, stay in the same place. And other times they're uh, rather ephemeral and uh, occur very quickly, and then they're gone. Um, so I'm not quite sure what, what caused the event that you're talking about, but not unusual to see them um, just about anywhere. Okay, we've got a question from Frances in Colorado. She wants to know more about the melting of the polar ice caps. Does that have an effect on the severe weather, uh, supplying more water for the atmosphere to work with? Well, there have been a lot of theories in, in recent years about the, uh, the lower ice um, coverage in the, in the poles, in the, north, in the north especially, the northern polar regions, and, and its impact on, uh, on the jet stream configuration. Um, there are some studies to suggest that actually the jet stream uh, can become uh, more amplified uh, with the lack of, uh, of sea ice in the Arctic. Um, but I believe a lot of this research is very preliminary. Um, I don't. I, I have not yet seen a firm, uh, uh, you know, in, incontrovertible link uh, to the lack of sea ice in the Arctic and and the behavior of the jet stream. And of course, we're talking about time scales that are different as well. I mean, that the minimum in sea ice usually occurs in the fall. Um, I think last year, last autumn, had the, the record lowest amount of sea ice. Uh, during the satellite era, and uh, and sometimes the question is how long does that when, once the ice starts coming back, um, you know what what impact does that have uh, on the subsequent jet stream amplitude? And uh, I think the answer is you know still not known. Uh, there again, there are some studies to suggest that the amp amplification increases with lack of sea ice, uh, but I'm not sure that there's enough evidence to support that quite yet. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, we've got two more questions here, and then we're going to wrap it up for the for the the talk today. We can almost combine these possibly. Larry writes in and wants to know what are why are the most significant weather events located in the Midwest, and then uh, Josh from Alabama wants to know how big a factor is the Gulf of Mexico in forecasting for the southeast. So two kind of geographic questions, and we'll we'll end with those today. Okay. Yeah, they are related. Um, the topography of the land and, and uh, coastal areas plays a huge uh, role in bringing together the ingredients necessary for widespread severe weather. And so in the, when we look at the North American continent, you have the Rocky Mountains uh, essentially across the western part of the continent, and then the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic off to the southeast. And because the winds in the atmosphere are basically from west to east, in fact, the jet stream is crossing the Rocky Mountains. What you have set up to the lee of the Rockies is almost a semi-permanent zone of lower pressure across the Great Plains and Midwest. Whenever you have strong winds crossing the Rocky Mountains, you have what's called a lee cyclone form on the lee side of the Rockies out over the Plains and Midwest. When you form that low pressure system in the Plains and Midwest, you need to fill that void, so to speak, when low pressure essentially means the air mass, the air is lower in pressure and it wants to bring air from around it. And so when you're trying to fill that lower pressure zone, you're bringing air from the Gulf of Mexico or even as far as the Atlantic, you're bringing moist air into that region. So you have a, a combination of topography and upper level atmospheric dynamics that play into bringing the ingredients together for severe weather events. And not just tornadoes and, and severe thunderstorms, but heavy rainfall or even blizzard conditions. The storm track essentially goes from the west and across the Rockies, through the plains, and up into the Midwest Great Lakes region. And because of that, you see the, uh, you see the preponderance of, of storm tracks in those areas of the country, but you also have a source of fuel with the Gulf of Mexico there. Um, uh, to, to fuel this, this weather activity. And, uh, and there really isn't any other place on the planet with the same type of topography over such an extensive region as we see here in the continental United States. You have smaller areas that mimic this. Uh, in, in South America and even in Europe, there are smaller areas that have mountains and warm water and bodies of water in proximity to one another, but on a much smaller scale than what we have here in North America. So we just hap happen to be in a uh, topographic location and in the mid-latitudes uh, in a way that brings, brings together these, uh, these storm ingredients and, and results in very active weather patterns. Well, thank you very much. I, I wonder if we have Nolan on with us. Nolan, are you in the background there? Can you hear me? We can. Yeah, oh, excellent. Yeah, excellent. great. Thanks. Glad you to join us. First, I want to just comment for the benefit of, of all the listeners. Uh, as you've heard from Greg today, any of a number of times, our reports from Kokoroz are being incorporated into the analyses that go into these storm assessments. And so, once again, showing, proving convincingly the value of what we as volunteers do, also reminding us of the potential val uh, value of submitting more than just your once a day precipitation report if you do have severe weather, uh, getting in there and submitting significant weather reports really can help as well. Greg, uh, great talk, appreciate it. And I would like to know from your northeastern perspective, are the greatest hourly snowfalls that have ever been observed typically associated with nor'easters, or are there other situations where we've been able to match those four, five, six inch an hour sorts of things? I know here in Colorado, anything over one to two inches an hour is really, really amazing, but sometimes we can keep that going for a lot of consecutive hours, whereas the nor'easters tend to just blow through. Well, I, I have to say that I think that if you're looking at, at sustained, really extreme snowfall rates, it's probably going to be associated with lake effect uh, more than it would be uh, nor'easters because there you have this continuous uh, uh, fetch of, you know, you, you see some really incredible uh, and what we call convective snowfall events occur downstream of the Great Lakes and I would imagine in some other parts of the world as well. But I'll bet you the Great Lakes, especially the Tug Hill Plateau area of upstate New York, 
um, has seen snowfall rates um, of the magnitudes that we saw with the blizzard this year uh, on, a, on a fairly regular basis. Um, probably almost once a year they may experience rates of four, five, six inches an hour uh, for a few hours in a row. Uh, downstream of Lake Ontario and, and Lake Erie. That, that would be my guess. I'm sure there are other areas uh, where topography and ocean play a role. Perhaps parts of Japan uh, can occasionally see snowfall rates like we saw with the blizzard in the northeast. And there was an extreme event this year with the, uh, with the nor'easter up there. Um, but uh, my guess is the, the, the lake effect would probably win the prize. Hey, great. Hey, thanks so much. Well, Greg, we want to thank you again for taking time to, to present this. It's just so neat to look back at things we actually probably maybe have forgotten about and, and just to see them uh, for the memories of, of the weather, especially for us folks who love weather, uh, these events in 2013. So really appreciate you being with us. Uh, possibly we'll see you at the AMS meeting in Atlanta. And uh, with that, we want to say goodbye for today. Uh, we want to, again, thank Greg for his time. And for those of you out there, uh, we want you to hopefully join us for our next Kokoros Weather Talk webinar. Uh, mark your calendars for Thursday, uh, December 5th. And at that time, Ben Beard, he is the chief of the Bacterial Diseases Branch uh, at the CDC, located here, Center for Disease Control in Fort Collins, Colorado. He's going to talk about climate change, ecology, and disease emergence, a public health perspective. And I think uh, you'll find that uh, quite interesting if you uh, want to know what's happening with the climate and how that affects health. So if you'll sign up for that, you can do that on our website. Finally, before you leave today, if you'll take a look at our survey and answer a couple quick questions, that'll help us with our evaluation. So uh, for Greg Carbon and Nolan and the rest of the gang here, we want to thank you for joining us today, and we wish you a, a good week ahead. Take care and have a good day.